Michael was awoken by a light knocking on the door of his room. His eyes opened and he felt a sudden panic before he remembered the events of last night as they flashed through his mind. The cemetery. Victor. The blood sprang from Victor's neck and the wound healing right before his eyes. At first, he assumed that it must have been a strange nightmare, but then he realized that he was in a bed with carved mahogany bedposts. The room had hardwood floors, black walls with white exiting the ceiling. There was beautiful furniture everywhere he looked, dressers, nightstands, wooden chairs all appearing to be hundreds of years old, yet still in immaculate condition. There was a colored light coming from the window, and as he glanced towards it, he could see the stained glass that created a beautiful image of the Virgin Mary. She had a halo gleaming behind her head, and she wore a pale blue dress as she lovingly glanced down towards the bed, holding up two fingers as if to bless him. Mr. Hamilton, it's time to wake up, sir. Mr. Manamont would like to speak with you. A voice rang through the door. It was a friendly voice. It sounded like a young man, maybe early 20s. All right, thank you, Michael sleepily called out to the man. Thoughts began to race through Michael's head. Did the events of last night really happen? Do vampires really exist? How could that be possible? Everything Michael thought about reality and fiction came crumbling down before him. What did this mean? How many vampires walked the earth? What other legends could be real? Michael rolled out of bed. On a chair next to the window was a suit laid out before him. Connected to the room was a bathroom and Michael decided to take advantage of the chance to clean himself up. He started the shower, still thinking of how he would approach Victor. Did he just want to have him run errands for him during the daylight hours? Vampires can't go in the sunlight, right? Don't they burst into flames or something? Dear God, what if he wants to make me a vampire? Michael suddenly thought to himself. The thought made him slightly dizzy and he nearly lost his footing in the shower. He braced himself against the shower wall and began to breathe heavily. What the fuck is going on here? He said to himself, wide-eyed and in a panic. He gathered his wits and finished up in the shower. As he was wiping down the mirror, he noticed a new razor and toothbrush had been set up in the bathroom as well. He shaved, brushed his teeth, and combed his hair. He felt clean, good about himself as he looked in the mirror. If he was a vampire, would he still see his reflection? He thought to himself. He put on the fine suit that was on the chair. It was an Armani, black, and seemed to be perfectly tailored to fit his frame. Michael was medium build, about six foot tall, and now had long black hair with a couple of streaks of gray coming down the right side of his head. His eyes were a gray-blue color that resembled the turbulent ocean during a storm. He gave himself a firm look in the mirror. He used to do this before an important meeting at the bonds firm he worked at before his life fell apart. He would give himself a little pep talk to help calm his nerves. All right, you got this. Whatever happens, you can handle it. You are strong. You are confident. Let's do this. He told his mirrored self while looking into his own eyes. He then left the bathroom, took one more deep breath, and opened the door to the bedroom to venture through the mansion in search of Victor. To his surprise, as he exited, the young man was still standing near his door. The man quickly perked up at the sight of Michael. Sir, Mr. Manamont was waiting in the library for you. Please, follow me, the man said. He was smaller, no taller than 5'8 and thin. His auburn hair was well kept and he had freckles that ran across his nose and under his eyes. They were in sharp contrast to his pale skin. His bright green eyes seemed to nearly glow in the dimly lit hallway. They walked past countless rooms, some with closed doors and others open, each appearing to be another bedroom similar to his. Every window they passed was beautifully crafted stained glass depicting different religious themes and saints. The paintings that adorned the walls were all gothic in nature and extremely macabre. Some shone gothic cathedrals with dark undertones and colors. One shone nothing more than a drowned woman lying face up in a pond. The hallway walls were a deep red wallpaper with filigree designs in them with a metallic red tone. The scent of candles burning and some mix of pleasant smelling spices filled the air. Finally, the room opened up into a large area. Double staircases wrapped around towards the ground level. Hanging above the staircase was a massive hand-painted reproduction of Dante, Divine Comedy by Granger. 
It depicts Satan devouring the bodies of the damned. Tortured souls surround him, their pain and suffering apparent, their bodies and faces twisted with pain and sheer terror. Some people were bound and being tortured, poked and prodded by winged demons who seemed to enjoy the suffering they were afflicting upon those who were damned. It goes to the various levels of hell and the intense torture those who have earned their place must face. Sir, the young man said, making Michael slightly jump as he realized he was enthralled with the mass of painting before him. This way, Mr. Hamilton. Yes, sorry, let's go, Michael apologized. They continued and descended the stairs, his footsteps reverberating a slight echo through the great hall. The lower level looked more familiar to him as he recalled his arrival the night before. The room had a checkered patterned marble floor with more paintings adorning the walls. Many classic darker themed paintings depicting demons devouring men, death, and witchcraft. At the end of each staircase there was a hand carved bust of Victor on black marble. To the right was the familiar doors to the library. A flash of Victor's throat being cut wide open and pried apart with Victor's own hands shot through Michael's mind like a bullet. A shiver ran through his body at the image of the blood spraying and pouring from Victor's neck and covering the front of him and soaking into the carpet below him. The rich smell of burning cherry wood filled his nose as they entered the library. Victor was sitting in the chair he had been in last night, holding a wine glass. There was no sign that anything had happened the night before. Not a single drop of blood on the floor and the carpet had been replaced with a new one with a slightly different design. Victor stood with a warm smile holding his arms open to welcome Michael. Mr. Hamilton, you look dashing. I trust you found the accommodations I provided to your liking, he said, greeting Michael, motioning for him to take a seat in the same chair he had sat in last night. Y yes, thank you. Victor, what time is it? Is it night already? I suppose it would have to be, wouldn't it? You would have to be in your coffin or something if the sun was up, right? Michael replied, taking a seat. <laughs> Mr. Hamilton, I assure you that much you have heard of my kind is nothing more than fiction. Though, yes, it is dusk, I will not burst into flames if touched by the light of day, nor do I sleep in a coffin of any kind. I am sure you have noticed that I have many religious symbols throughout my home. That, too, is another myth perpetrated by the dogma of the church, explained Victor. How about blood? Michael said, glancing towards the wine glass in Victor's hands. That, unfortunately, is true. I do require the blood of mortal men to nourish me, though at my age it's not exactly needed as often as it would be for most of my kind. Victor replied, swirling the red liquid in the glass around, looking down at it. And just how old are you? Michael asked. I was born in Lancaster, England, in the year 1563. My father was the village baker, owned by the lord of the land. My mother passed in childbirth, which was very common at the time. I became what I am during a witchcraft ritual where I was the sacrifice. The coven of witches summoned a demon and my mortal life was taken. The demon, who called himself Baal and first appeared as a black dog with glowing red eyes, entered my body and infused itself with me, making me unable to die, unable to be inflicted with illness. I am not sure how others like me are made besides my own children, but I do know that there were others before me and more after," Victor explained. So you're what, like 450 years old then? Michael said in disbelief, still trying to wrap his head around this entire ordeal. 455 to be exact, said Victor. So, Michael, have you thought about the offer I extended to you last night? Do you have any questions concerning that? You bet your ass I do. I need you to elaborate on this offer further. Will I be running errands for you? Will I be your accountant or something? Are you going to turn me into one of your servants, a vampire like you? Can you even do that? asked Michael. Victor gave him a half smile, looking as if he was amused by these questions. Mr. Hamilton, I would like to make you a part of my family, share with you this gift that I was given so long ago. At the time, I thought it was a curse. I hid from humanity, 
feared the ridicule and judgment I would face if they knew what I was. If they knew that I was a monster. I feared holy men. I feared the light. I know now I needn't fear such things. I can in fact make others similar to me. Not exactly as I am, as the blood becomes diluted in time or age strengthens us, possibly both. But you see, I have a problem. And I need good men and women such as yourself to assist me in this problem. Victor explained. What is this problem? asked Michael. The Trindells, Victor said coldly. They're a family of hunters. They have been growing in numbers and strength. They have been hounding me for over 200 years now. I have defeated countless members of their family, but they refuse to give up their holy pursuit. They are convinced that I am nothing but evil, a curse on the world who only wishes to destroy and spread evil. I assure you, nothing could be further from the truth. I had no choice in becoming what I am, and I only wished to live. They have forced my hand every time in killing one of theirs, and I only feed on those who bring harm onto others or offer themselves to me. Now I must build myself a formidable army in defense of those who hunt me and wish to do me and all I have built harm. It is truly unfortunate that I have been pushed to make such drastic steps to ensure my right to survival. So I ask you, Mr. Hamilton, what say you? Michael stopped and thought for a moment. What would this mean for him? Granted, everything of value he had in his life his wife had already taken from him. His family, his children. He really has nothing to lose at this point, and this man has shown him some respect, kindness, and given him a place to stay. He was grateful for that. But would this mean he would constantly have to battle for his life? Thirst for blood? Would people know what he is? What he has become? He finally reached a conclusion and spoke. Well, Victor, the way I see it, what do I have to lose at this point? Fuck it. I'll join your little family here. You've shown me kindness, and you've welcomed me, and clearly you feel you can have some use for me, Michael said. Excellent, replied Victor.